Regret is about trying to change things in the past, and the past is definitely not up to you to change. Often, when I have this conversation, people would say, well, but I can't help it. And that is simply not true. Of course you can help it. There's very good empirical evidence from modern science that, of course, you can change your emotions. Not, you know, by snapping your fingers. That's not true. It, it does require uh, exercise. It does require mindfulness. But now, every time that something happens, that a potential setback occurs, my immediate first automatic thought is, okay, what is up to me here? And, and then I start focusing on, on that part. And it immediately makes you feel better. Because one of the things that causes anxiety and regret is precisely the fact that you feel like you don't have power over the situation. Powerlessness is something that human beings don't really like. And so focusing on what you can do in a given situation, however little it may be, is crucial because you regain control of your actions, you regain control of your emotional responses and you actually face the setback in a more productive, constructive fashion. Massimo, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. No, not at all. Great to have you here. So something that's uh, intriguing me is how did evolutionary biology leave you to studying Stoic philosophy? A midlife crisis. <laughs> you know, at, at some point we all go through it. And um, in fact, especially professional academics, actually, uh, at some point you start asking yourself, okay, this is, this is good. I've done some decent stuff, but do I really want to keep going like this for another 20, 30 years? And when I asked myself that question a few years ago, I thought, no, I, I really do something different. Turns out that that something different uh, ended up to be really different. I moved to philosophy, which is literally on the other side of campus, uh, physically speaking, and pretty far from what I was doing before. Although, to be fair, I moved into philosophy of science, so I'm actually still a lot talking and thinking about science, but from a, an outsider's perspective at this point, not from the inside. There's still elements of, of evolution within within this because obviously so much of our understanding of morals ethics all comes from the, the sort of dna of, of greco-roman philosophers with the influence of christianity as we now know it so with that in mind why do you think 21st century there's been a big resurgence in quoting the stoics honoring the stoics talking about them what why do you think that is did it come from a place of necessity desperation maturity what why are we now talking about the stoics in so much more detail again well, actually, the surprise is that during the 20th century, we didn't talk too much about the Stoics, <laughs> because as it turns out, uh, the Stoics have been popular in terms of practical lived philosophy ever since they came about. There was no interruption. During the Middle Ages, for instance, one of the major Stoic writers, Epictetus, was used, was very well known and used by Christian monks and, and Christian theologians in their discussions. They also talked a lot about Seneca, another one of the, of the big Stoics. So, in fact, the anomaly is really the 20th century. For some reason, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Greco-Roman philosophy in general and practical philosophy kind of disappeared from view for a while. But then it came back near the end of the 20th century, I think, and largely, I think, for, for a couple of reasons. One, there was a concerted effort by some people who were interested in practical philosophy, beginning with Pierre Hadot, who was a French scholar who wrote three fundamental books about modern practical philosophy based on the Greco-Romans. But also because, quite frankly, the same problems that the, the Greco-Romans had to deal with are the ones that affect us. You know, the technology that we, and the science that we experience today, of course, is very different. If Marcus Aurelius were to join our conversation today, he would be astonished by the way in which we communicate and, you know, the fact that we can talk thousands of miles away and that sort of stuff. But once he got over that initial shock and he actually started paying attention to what we're talking about, what kind of problems we're, we're having, what kind of wants and needs and fears and, uh, and anxieties and stuff like that, then he actually would start say, oh, okay, I've heard this before. Um, this, this is not new, new, really. I can contribute a few a few thoughts. So I think that that's the reason, those are the two reasons. One, there, was, there has been a concerted effort to bring back the Greco-Romans, but that concerted effort has worked because their preoccupations are pretty much the same ones that we have. Humans are all the same deep down, aren't they? <laughs> Whatever the challenge is. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's interesting to note that because there's a lot going on in the world. I think it's fair to say. I think since March of 2020, we've we've kind of accelerated. The foot is on the gas, and it hasn't really let up. So, 
given given the the chaos, given the white noise that we all need to deal with, what elements of Stoke philosophy philosophy can we implement in our day to day lives to allow us to live a happier, more fulfilling life? Because virtue, value are all things that are inherently important within the philosophy, but those are things that can help us live a happier, more fulfilled life, aren't they? Yeah, I think the, the, the very first thing that can help us is the basic idea that Stoicism uh, shares in common with other Greco-Roman philosophies, as well as, frankly, with Eastern traditions, for instance, like Buddhism or Taoism or Confucianism. That is, the very base, basic idea of adopting and developing and practicing a philosophy of life. The, the notion of having a philosophy of life is actually should actually be kind of the, uh, very widespread because we all have a philosophy of life, whether we realize it or not. Uh, most of us get our philosophy from religion. You know, we grew up in a religious family uh, or in a religious environment, religious society, and therefore we acquire three fundamental components that I think are common to every philosophy of life. And these components are a metaphysics and ethics and a set of practices. A metaphysics is a way uh, to think about the world. So if you're a Christian, for instance, you understand the world as being created by an all-powerful God, that sort of stuff. If you're a Stoic, you understand the world as the result of physical uh, interacting events, cause and effect, that, that sort of thing. In terms of ethics, ethics is an account of how we should live in the world. So if you're a Christian, you follow the Ten Commandments, at least ideally. Uh, you are inspired by the teachings of Jesus and so on. If you're a Stoic, you use something called the four cardinal virtues as, as a way to navigate life. You read Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and things like that. And then in terms of practices, if you are a Christian, you go to church, you read scriptures and meditate on scripture, you talk to other Christians about things, you listen to what your preacher or, or priest is saying. Similarly, if you're a Stoic, you read uh, the ancient texts as well as modern versions uh, of them, modern commentaries, you talk to other Stoic practitioners, and uh, you keep in mind, you try to keep in mind what um, these people are telling you that is relevant to everyday life. So really, the notion of having adopting a philosophy of life is something that uh, is essentially universal. I mean, everybody has it. The Greco-Roman idea is that given that you do have a philosophy of life anyway, you might as well make a conscious decision about which one to adopt and from time to time check whether it works for you or not. It may turn out that uh, just because you were born Christian or Jew or Muslim or whatever it is, yeah, it might be turned out that that's not exactly the best thing for you. It doesn't work very well, in which case, once in a while, you want to stop and think about, you know, what else is around? What else? What are alternatives, ways of thinking and, and living life are there? And should I give it a try? So in essence, it's a case of, of reflecting on the life that you're living and, and finding the, the code of ethics that lives best in line with that rather than being bound by the code of ethics that you feel you should be living within. Is that, is that a, fair, a fair summary? That's right. That's right. And the, the main reason to do that is because you don't want to get to the end of your life, look back and say, oh, crap. <laughs> right? Uh, you want to get, which, in fact, a lot of people do. There is research in modern psychology about sort of end of life uh, you know, thinking that, that people do when they're on their bed, not literally necessarily on their deathbed, but close to the end of their life, they look back. And it turns out that some people, of course, as you might expect, are pretty happy about uh, the life they lived. Others are not so happy. And it turns out that the people that are happy are happy for the kinds of reasons that the Stoics or the, the Buddhists, for instance, would, would be not surprised. Uh, they're happy about their lives because they spend time cultivating friendships, uh, cultivating relationships with their loved ones, doing something that is meaningful to them uh, and also useful to society, that sort of stuff. Nobody gets to the end of their life and, and, and says, I regret not having spent more time on Facebook you know, or something like that. It's like that, that just never comes up. And so why not doing it before? Why, why not realize those priorities and implement those priorities before you get to your deathbed? Yeah, it's a fascinating take because it's not often I get to uh, get to use this in in conversation. But my degree is in theology and religion, and uh -huh. the reason that I was drawn to that as a as a as a sort of academic study is because I was just interested in how 
morality ethics were were born into society and why even in the uk for example as a non-practicing christian nation now i mean the the, the, the decline's been quite aggressive the the morality is generally still there for the most part in terms of people's general understanding of what what is good and what is bad comes from a place of religion so when you actually look at the stoics and you take away deities from that it makes it quite a practical way of looking at things from a personal point of view rather than this overwhelming view of the world so for myself as somebody who's probably agnostic more than i'd say atheist it gives me more power to change things within my own circumstances which i think is is useful if you're somebody that feels that way because i think actually having no faith can be just as damaging as having faith that can mislead you because it, it, it yeah. guides you in the right direction in the wrong direction so this the stoic philosophy generally and as we'll come on to the four cardinal virtues that you've mentioned that underpin all of this it gives you it gives you power over yourself which i think can be a, a very good way of steering your own ship so just on that the four cardinal virtues that you mentioned do you want to just give us some context on what those are and how they're relevant for the conversation sure the the four cardinal virtues are the fundamental virtues and virtu first of all virtues are character traits right they are behavioral tendencies so if you say for instance that your friend uh, is generous is a generous person what you mean is that other things being equal uh, he or she will uh, devote time resources money whatever to help others that's what it means to be generous so it's it's a question of behavior right Ten behavioral tendencies according to the ancient not just the stoics but the ancient greco romans there are four cardinal meaning m fundamentally important virtues from which all of the other virtues actually are uh, derived or related to and those are practical wisdom courage justice and temperance practical wisdom uh, in in greek the, the word is phronesis is knowledge of what is good and what is not good that is it's essentially knowledge of the kinds of things that you should be doing and the kind of things that you should stay away from okay it's a it's your basic moral compass courage is the tendency to do things because they're right even though there may be a personal cost uh, to doing those things right justice is the notion that we should be treating other people with fairness and respect the way in which we would want to be treated in turn and temperance is the idea that you should be doing things in in right measure neither too much nor too little so the basic idea is that when you are faced with any kind of major or frankly even minor decision in life or uh, when you're facing a setback and and you have to figure out a way to overcome it the first thing you do is you consult your your cardinal virtues and use them kind of as a moral compass and, and you ask yourself well is what i'm contemplating doing temperate courageous just and frenetic or you know practical uh, from practically wise well why were these questions so dominant in stoic philosophy because i, I appreciate it was a a very intricate and and well -formed, formed empire for the time but it was still quite a chaotic existence where other other sides of the world wouldn't even be considering these questions because it'd just be a case of finding food surviving the next battle whatever it was going on why were these questions so pertinent and so dominant when it came to leadership when it came to ethics because the simplicity of the questions from a leadership point of view is so well written about that we can now understand it in the modern world but that's only come from the work that was done then on really really focusing in on these questions so why why were they such a focus for these philosophers so we're talking about a time, the 5th century, around the 5th or 6th century BCE, where there was a major transition in, in, the, in the West. We're talking about the Mediterranean area for now. Although, interestingly, very similar transitions, very similar things were happening in, in both India and China and gave origin, respectively, to uh, Buddhism in India and then Confucianism and Taoism in China. And, and those... Those transitions also happen at about the same time, Buddhism one or two centuries earlier, Confucianism and Taoism at about the same time as the Greco-Roman uh, change. So in terms of what the Greco-Romans were doing, there was a major shift uh, going from uh, an ethics or a, or a worldview that was informed by poets, by poetry. So think of Homer, for instance, right? So the, the very ancient Greeks, the pre-classical Greeks, uh, were getting their marching orders basically from the Homeric heroes. They were looking at Achilles or, or uh, Odysseus and things like that, and that's how they understood the world. 
the gods were in charge and were directly interfering with uh, human affairs, you know, manipulating human beings one way or the other. And what it meant to be a good human being was uh, to behave pretty much like Odysseus or Achilles or, you know, one of these heroes was, was behaving. And then around the 6th century BCE, there was a major shift uh, caused by a number of philosophers, of what we today call philosophers, uh, and then in fact we today call pre-Socratics, because they lived, most of them lived just before Socrates, like a few decades to about a century before Socrates. Uh, these are people like Thales and Miletus or Heraclitus or Parmenides. And these people made a major change. They, they thought, wait a minute, forget the, the poets and the mythology. We live in a world that can be understood on the basis of natural processes. So if I want to want to know why is tendering and raining out there, I don't I don't think in terms of Zeus getting upset. I think in terms of natural phenomena. I think in terms of things that I can understand and potentially manipulate because knowledge is power as Francis Bacon said much much later on. So this shift eventually with Socrates became also a shift in ethics. The ethics now becomes you know, the word ethics comes from the Greek ethos, and ethos means having a good character. And why do you want to have a good character? Because you have to live with other human beings. If you don't have a good character, if you're not cooperative, if you're not pro-social, then you're going to have a pretty tough life in a human society, right? And so it, essentially this, this, this shift led to an understanding of uh, how to live your life in terms of how to live well within a human society within a polis, and that's what the Greco-Roman, uh, you know, invention of, of what we today call ethics amounts to. And ever since, we've really been thinking about ethics in the same way. That ethics is about how to live well with other human beings. It's it's the golden question, really, isn't it? And it's it's something <laughs> that was was hotly discussed back then and is now. But Greco-Roman philosophers spent a lot of time discussing what it took to be virtuous, to be an excellent human. And that that is ultimately the definition of virtue, isn't it? Is to to be excellent. It's a, a rete. And we then move to the question in in your newest book: Can it be taught? And Socrates had sort of two clear dialogues on this, didn't he? And <laughs> frustratingly, almost they they lead to completely different conclusions. So do you want to just probably first of all run us through, as I touched upon there, what virtue actually means? And then secondly, just set the scene for, for the, the next stage of this, the discussion we'll have in terms of can can virtue be taught by exploring Socrates' two dialogues? Yeah, those are two crucial questions. So, so let's start with what virtue is. The word virtue comes from the Greek arete, which, as you mentioned a minute ago, means excellence. Now, so to be virtuous means to be an excellent, excellent at something. Um, and that something doesn't have to be necessarily ethics, and in fact... Excellence is not just something that human beings have. You can, you can be an, an excellent in, uh, object. For instance, a few days ago, my wife and I went uh, and bought a, a new bread knife because we needed a, you know, a, a rely more reliable tool than we, than we had at that time. Now, we bought an excellent bread knife, meaning a bread knife that is arete. Uh, it's, it does what it's supposed to be doing very well, right? as opposed to a non-excellent bread knife, which would be a, a bread knife that is blunt and therefore doesn't actually cut the bread as it should. Now the question then becomes, okay, and what, is it, what counts as an excellent human being? In the case of a knife, we get it. Fine, if, if, if it cuts, then it's excellent. What about a human being? The Greco-Romans, and this is one of the most surprising things about their thought and, and one of the things that really makes it still relevant today. Even though they knew nothing about science, they knew nothing about evolution, you know, close to nothing about science, and definitely nothing about evolution or primatology or, you know, anything like that. They came up with a fundamental idea that we still think today is pretty much true. Human beings, by nature, are shaped by nature to be social beings. Right? So an excellent human being is one that does two things. One, it reasons correctly, and two, acts in a pro-social fashion, in a cooperative fashion with other human beings. Now, why would those two things be crucial? Because those are the two things that distinguish human beings from every other animal species. 
So when the Stoics ask themselves, you know, what makes for a human being as opposed to a lion or a termite or anything else, their answer was pretty much on target. We are incredibly smart. We can think our way through problems. As we would put it today, our evolutionary weapon is our brain because we don't have big muscles, we don't fly, we don't have fangs, we don't have, you know, not, nothing like, like what other animals do, but we do have large brains, and those large brains al allow us to coordinate answers to existential problems and try to solve them problems. So that's the first thing. We're very, we're very smart. We're capable of reason. Now, that doesn't mean that we use reason correctly all the time, but we are certainly capable of doing it. And the second thing that characterizes us is that we're highly social. There are other social animals, social insects, for instance, social other social primates such as the bonobo chimpanzees and you know, capuchin monkeys and things like that. But human societies are far more complex and far more intricate and far more interconnected than anything else uh, that, that is in nature. So the Greco-Romans didn't know that this is the result of th these two things, uh, large brains and high sociality, are the results of natural selection for survival and reproduction. But they understood that they are natural characteristics of human beings. Just like a natural characteristic of a, of a bread knife is to cut bread, <laughs> is the ability to cut bread. And so an excellent or a virtuous human being is one who A, uses reason correctly, and B, does so in order to improve social, li social living. And Socrates' conclusions on these was, were, rather, that one line of thinking was that we could be taught this, and the other line of thinking was that we couldn't be taught this. So right. in terms of unpacking those, as you do in the book, which elements are, what's important to, to set out so that we understand how he's come to those very, very disparate conclusions? Yeah. The crucial dialogue there is a uh, platonic dialogue that was written, so a dialogue written by Plato that's called the Protagoras, where Socrates has this interesting discussion with Protagoras. Protagoras was one of the sophists. And typically, Socrates and the sophists are kind of at odds with each other. They see things very differently. But in this particular case, they actually end up agreeing. They start out the dialogue from different positions. Socrates says, I don't think virtue can be taught. And Protagoras says, yes, he can. And, and then after a little bit of discussion, they end up agreeing. And they agree because Protagoras explains that virtue cannot be taught in the way in which we teach theoretical subject matters. So if you were to study, let's say, quantum mechanics, right, uh, it would be mostly theory. I mean, there are experiments, of course, in quantum mechanics, but it's mostly about theory. You, it, you sit down, you open a book, uh, you listen to somebody's lectures, and you learn quantum mechanics. That's what it means to learn quantum mechanics. So it's, it's mostly or almost exclusively a theoretical enterprise. And Protagoras agrees with Socrates that that's not how virtue works. You, you can't just sit down and learn about virtue and then say, oh, I'm virtuous. What it is is more similar to a, what the, the Greeks called a techne, a skill. A technique, right? So it's so Protagoras makes the analogy there with playing the flute, and he says, "Look, uh, what happens when you want to learn to play a musical instrument like the flute? Well, you do three things. You need three things. You need a little bit of theory. Uh, you know, it's not entirely a theoretical thing, but you do need a little bit of theory. You, you need to know about musical notations and about the relationship between the, the notes. Otherwise, you're just going to get random stuff out of your flute, and that's not good. Doesn't sound good." You do need, ideally, a good teacher, meaning somebody who doesn't is not in the business of transferring a lot of theoretical information to you, just as in the case of a you know, physics professor, let's say, but is somebody who looks at your technique and can make suggestions for improvements, right? Can, can point out, is like, well, no, actually, what you're doing here is not quite right. Try these other things. So it's a practical kind of teaching, right? And then the third thing you need, most importantly, is practice, 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 practice. So you, you do a lot of the, the simple scales, and then you get more complicated scales, and you start with simple tunes, you go to more complicated tunes, and you do that every day for hours every day until you get, you get better. And in fact, it's a lifelong thing. You ne never stop really practicing the flute or any other musical instrument. If you look at virtue that way, as a technique, as a skill, then all of a sudden it turns out, yes, it can be taught. Uh, what you need is a little bit of theory. For instance, I gave you a few minutes ago the four cardinal virtues, and I explained 
what they are and how they work. That's theory. That's the theoretical part. Then, if you're lucky enough that you find a, you know, yourself acquainted with a Socrates or, or, or a Seneca or an Epictetus, great. Uh, that's somebody who can uh, teach you in the same way in which a music teacher or a language teacher, for that matter, uh, will teach. Or a gym trainer, for instance, the same, same kind of general idea, right? The gym trainer doesn't do the exercises for you. It only looks at you doing the exercises and says, so actually, this is not the right form and or, or you want to change it this way and then what do you do most of the times you practice now the question however is it's pretty clear i think to most of us how you practice a musical instrument or how you practice a language or how you practice uh, exercises at the gym but how the hell do you practice virtue right and here's a couple of examples Musonius Rufus, who was a Stoic teacher, he was a, a Stoic philosopher, he was a Epictetus teacher, he, been, he, he lived in the first century of the modern era, said that, for instance, if you want to practice temperance, temperance is one of the four cardinal virtues, is, is the one that has to do with doing things in the right measure, neither too much nor too little. Well, you, have, you get yourself at least three occasions every day to practice temperance, every time you sit at the table to eat something. Because if you start paying mindful attention to what you eat and how you eat and, and you know, how much and so on and so forth, then you're practicing temperance, temperance, which is really mindful attention to a particular uh, activity that you are in, uh, that you're involved in. So that's one simple way to practice temperance. One way to practice, let's say, generosity, which is not one of the four cardinal virtues, but it is a virtue nevertheless, might be to, let's say, get into the habit of, before you leave the house, uh, get some change, pocket change uh, with you, and then go out and, the, and you give that change to the first homeless person you encounter. No questions asked. Now, initially, this will feel a little awkward. It will feel like, you know, what am I doing here? But the more you do every day the same thing, or most times of, of the week the same thing, then it becomes a habit. It becomes a sort of second nature. It's like, in fact, learning an instrument or driving, learning to drive a car. Initially, you have to pay a lot of attention to everything you do consciously, but after a while, it becomes sort of second nature. So you do it without even thinking about it. So that's how you, you practice virtue. It, it, it's interesting. It, it, the, the, the last examples there are, are great because you can't just get in a car and drive it unless you have a base level of understanding. So it's equipping somebody right. with, the, with the tools and the information, like all habits these days. So podcast culture there's there's so many things that are in vogue at the moment because of this habit stacking that we're all trying to be the best versions of ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis but in reality the four cardinal virtues are just here's a bit of a framework for you to be a better version of yourself one step forwards practice do the work do the repetitions you'll be better another step forwards do the practice do the repetitions do the work you'll be better and then over time you will actually create virtue within yourself rather than have to go elsewhere to find it which again goes back to the the reason that I take so much from Stoic philosophy because it gives you the power. You're not fi you're not searching for something else. You're not digging for gold and waiting for the gold. You're you're equipping yourself with what you need. <coughs> Excuse me. And one thing I want to want to draw upon is is why first of all first question is am I pronouncing this correctly? But second question will be why it's such a good example. But why is Alcibiades such a good example of? the dialogue that Socrates had on exactly this to paint a picture of of why it's a technique, a skill, rather than just something that can be orated and learnt. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the, the subtitle of, of the book of How to Be Good is uh, has to do with the relationship between Socrates and Alcibiades and what we can learn from them. And the reason for that is because Alcibiades was a fascinating character. I'm, I'm honestly surprised that nobody has made a movie out of his life yet. But um, hopefully somebody yet. will. Yet, being the yeah, key exactly. word. <laughs> yet, being the key word. To be fair, so, there, still, there still isn't a good enough movie for the Odyssey. I still think there's a big Hollywood, I know. Hollywood, Hollywood I, production I company waiting to go there. But And I'm looking I for, I, I hope it's in my generation when it does, because it, be, it would be fantastic. But I'd be the first one to buy a ticket. So Alcibiades was an incredible character in, in, in a number of respects. First of all, he was impossibly handsome. Uh, he was uber rich. It was dashing. It was brave. It was like almost everything you want in a in a person in a, in a human being. He had it. 
But he wanted to become a leader of Athens. He wanted to be a statesman. And so he goes to Socrates. When he was, this, this is when Alcibiades was very young. He was in his early 20s. And Socrates at the time was in his early 40s. And he goes to Socrates because Socrates is his friend and his mentor. It's rumored that they also were lovers, but probably not. Uh, goes to, to Socrates and says, you know, here is what I want to do. What, what do you think? And basically, Socrates sits Alcibiades down for essentially what we would today call a job interview and says, all right, let's, let's take a look. You know, wh what is it that, uh, how, how would you handle Athens, what would be your priorities? You know, what uh, what would you do? And it became be, it becomes increasingly clear in the dialogue. This uh, this dialogue is called the Alcibiades Meyer, which is attributed to Plato. It becomes very clear in the dialogue that Alcibiades really is not the right person for the job. Yes, he's brave. Yes, he's dashing. Yes, he's rich, but he doesn't have the right character. He's, he's not wise. He's into self-aggrandizing. Uh, is you know affected by hubris. He thinks that he can do a lot more than he can actually do. And by the end of the dialogue, Socrates uh, provides a pretty harsh response, you know, verdict to Alcibiades. He says, and, I, and I'm quoting, "Then, alas, Alcibiades, what a condition you suffer from! I hesitate to name it, but it must be said: you are wedded to stupidity, best of men, of the most extreme sort, as the argument accuses you, and you accuse yourself." So this is why you are leaping into the affairs of the city before you become educated. So basically, so it's, ouch. Socrates basically tells us, about it. it's like, just don't do it. Don't get into politics because you're exactly the wrong person. When he says, when Socrates says you're wedded to stupidity, uh, best of men, the, the word actually that is translated in uh, usually as stupidity is amatia, which in Greek actually means something closer to unwisdom. Basically, Alcibiades is lacking wisdom. And the, the thing that you Stupid want... Stupidity is much harsher, isn't it? That's a, that's a, that's a tough, tough translation for Alcibiades there. <laughs> that's right. But basically, it's all at this, what, what, he, what he's saying is that what you need as a politician, the first thing you need as a, as a statesman is actually wisdom, the ability to know what the right thing is and, and to act accordingly. Now, it turns out that Socrates gives advice of, either to get or not to get into a political career, to a number of people. And we know this not from Plato. Plato is our major source, of course, about Socrates, right? And as I said, the, the, there are two dialogues about Alcibiades, uh, which are allegedly written by Plato. But there is another source that we have for Socrates, and that's Xenophon. Xenophon was a general and uh, also a friend of Socrates and a student of Socrates. And he wrote a number of books on Socrates, one of which is called the Memorabilia, and it's essentially a, a philosophical biography of Socrates. And in the Memorabilia, we learn that Socrates has done this thing that he did with Alcibiades a number of times. So he, for instance, gives advice, uh, again, about getting or not getting into politics to a guy named Glaucon, who was actually Plato's brother. And he tells Glaucon, don't get into politics. And Glaucon, unlike Alcibiades, listens to Socrates. He doesn't get into politics. And, uh, in fact, he becomes a good musician, and he's, you know, he has a good life. Then Socrates talks to Charmides, who was Glaucon's own son. And Charmides was shy. He didn't want to get into politics. But Socrates thought that, Glau uh, that Charmides was, in fact, the right kind of person. He, was, uh, he had the virtues, and so he should get into politics. He nudges and he pushes him to go into politics, which Charmides does. And he does okay, unfortunately, for Charmides. Uh, he happened to get into politics at a really bad time in Athens, just after the end of the Peloponnesian War and uh, the defeat of Athens by Sparta. So it, the conditions were certainly not ideal, but Charmides tries to do his best. Another guy, again, that wants to get into politics and talk to Socrates is a fellow named Eutydemus. And there, too, Socrates says, don't, don't do it. I don't think you really know what you're talking about. And Eutydemus listens to Socrates and doesn't go into politics. Instead, it becomes Socrates' friends and, and, and student. So that kind of conjures the picture of Socrates himself, not as a politician. He never goes into politics himself. He says, you know, I'm not, I, I wouldn't be effective. Uh, probably because he's too blunt. He doesn't, you know, he's not very diplomatic. It just tells people, think, you know, as, as we were 
saying earlier, he tells Alcibiades pretty clearly what he thinks and or doesn't doesn't uh, and you know what is true and what do or doesn't uh, work. So Socrates himself is not good uh, material for a politician, but he can figure out, he can talk to people and, and figure out whether they have the right stuff in terms of character. And he becomes an advisor, essentially, an informal advisor to uh, wannabe statesmen. It's interesting that you, uh, you mentioned just how blunt he was, because brevity is something that is often so, so often promoted within Stoic philosophy. And I think is something that's probably lost in modern day politics is it's, it's everything short of brevity in the sense of sensationalism here and lack of clarity there. And uh, right. it, it's one of the things that I think as you just said, probably kept him away from politics well because the, the directness was was wasted on politics. It was almost better spent elsewhere. But I, I personally yeah. think it's a virtue that people should be less afraid of and more, more bought into because I, I'm much happier when people give me clear and direct information. And there's been a turning point in my life where I go from thinking, oh, that's a bit blunt, to, oh, thank you for being clear with me. And However, there is, I mean, that's true. And I, I, symp I sympathize, of course, <laughs> with your take. However, there is an interesting point here. That is, Socrates is wise enough to realize that he himself doesn't have what it takes to be a good politician, right? So he, he's, he's missing that diplomatic aspect. And in my book, I talk about another uh, two people that are interesting in this respect uh, that lived a little later, a few, you know, couple of centuries after Socrates. And that's uh, Cato the Younger, who was a Stoic and was a Roman senator in the uh, during the Republic, the, at, near the end of the history of the Roman Republic, and uh, his colleague and friend Cicero, who was not a Stoic, but he was a skeptic, but he was very sympathetic to the Stoics. And the difference between these two is very clear, because Cato approaches politics in the way in which Socrates says you shouldn't. That is, Cato is too blunt. Cato is, is uh, so concern with ethics and integrity that he simply cannot conceive compromising with his fellow senators and get anything done. It doesn't, in fact, it doesn't get anything done. Uh, and Cicero, on the other hand, says that, yes, you do need the virtues, you need you know, the, to try to do the right thing, but you also have to understand that the job of a politician is different from the job of a philosopher, and it does require compromise in order to be effective. At some point, Cicero writes a frustrated letter to his uh, lifelong friend Atticus complaining about Cato. And, and he says, um, and, and I quote, As for our friend Cato, you do not love him more than I do. But after all, with the very best intentions and the most absolute honesty, he sometimes does harm to the Republic. He speaks and votes as though he were in the Republic of Plato, not in the scum of Romulus. I love this contrast between the Republic of Plato, you know, meaning utopia, you know, the ideal, the ideal state, and the scum of Romulus, which Romulus, of course, was the founder, the legendary founder of Rome. Uh, where it's like, you know, real politics is about dealing with the scum stuff. You know, it's, it's dirty, it's muddy. You, you, you need to get, and you need to understand what you're dealing with because if you go into politics with not just ideals, ideals are fine. You, you do need the ideals because otherwise you, you're really going to be, it's really going to be bad. But you also need to understand that your ideals will not by themselves get you results. You have to talk to other people and you have to compromise, right? No, it's fascinating. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because it's uh, it, the, the the key the key word that kept popping into my head there was that potentially there was empathy lacking, and it's yeah. not something that's really spoken about much as a as a concept within Stoic philosophy within right. any of the sort of quotes that we see flying around. Empathy isn't something that crops up. Do you think it's something that was considered and wasn't spoken about because it wasn't necessarily understood, or do you think empathy in the context in which you've just explained was that compromise in that the the philosophy plus empathy equaled compromise. Philosophy without empathy equaled these maxims that we had to stick to and we had to work within because it lacked the human condition that ultimately meant there was more work to do. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. In, in, now, of course, the word empathy is pretty recent, recent coinage, so the ancients didn't use it, but they had something like that concept. And in fact, the Stoics made a distinction between what we would today call empathy and sympathy. Empathy, if, if we understand empathy as the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes, right, trying to, try to 
uh, feel the same feelings that or um, having the same emotions that the other person does as opposed to sympathy which is the ability to understand that another human being might feel in a certain way even though you yourself don't feel that way now the difference there is that the stoics would say you should practice sympathy not empathy and the reason for that is that empathy is uh it's about emotional uh, emotional responses and emotion can easily be manipulated in a way that doesn't lead to the right course of action sympathy on the other hand is a situation where even though you might not feel the same emotions as another person you understand as a human being that that person is in let's say distress or pain or whatever it is and you understand that you ought to be doing something in order to uh, help out right so Sympathy is more reason-directed, basically. It still has to do with the emotions, because for the Stoics, there was no fundamental distinction between reason and emotions, which modern science agrees. Modern cognitive science will tell you that there is no fundamental distinction there, that reason, reason and emotional responses are deeply interconnected in the human brain. But nevertheless, what you want to do is to understand how people feel and act accordingly rather than being emotionally involved yourself, because if you are emotionally involved yourself, then you might lose perspective on, on whatever the issue happens to be. It's interesting that that brings it back to to within as well as an individual, because a, a quote that I'll, I'll quote directly from Epictetus is, we must, not, we must make the best of those things that are in our power and take the rest as nature gives it, which from my understanding is control what we can, and work within what we can't which as you've just said control what we can is our understanding the wisdom that we've equipped ourselves with the work that we've done to practice that and create virtue within it we can understand other people's plight situation through sympathy but if we actually adopt empathy that's us trying to place ourselves in something that we actually can't control and it's a bit more hypothetical right. so right. with that in mind Reading that quote out again, we must make the best of those things that are in our power and take the rest as nature gives it. Which elements of virtue are in our control and which are not? Because you are you are the modern day moderator for the studies. You have you have written about this. From your perspective, what can we control and what can't we control when it comes to virtue? So the basic idea that the Stoics have is that pretty much the only thing that it's under our control, the only thing that, as Epitidos puts it, is up to us that is we're responsible for, is our considered judgments. That's it. That there's nothing else. Uh, I mean, the, those judgments take different forms and different, uh, you know, Epictetus uses different uh, words to refer to them uh, because these judgments include, you know, a assessment of a situation, uh, a decision to act or not to act, uh, prioritizing uh, certain values, you know, uh, over, over others. So all of those, however, are judgments. They're, they're all... Uh, situations where you think about you you are faced with a particular situation you think about it and you say okay this is what I'm gonna do or this is not what I'm gonna, gonna do and what is up to us is the judgment itself what is not up to us crucially is the outcome of our actions right so for instance I can arrive at the correct judgment that I ought to be taking care of my body which means uh, I decide to go to the gym on a regular basis to eat healthy, you know, to drink less, that sort of stuff. Those are those decisions are up to me. Okay, they're entirely up to me, meaning that nobody else can do them. Nobody, nobody else can actually arrive at that decision on my behalf. It is up to me in the sense that I'm responsible for them. However, will those decisions, in fact, lead to a healthy body and a longer life? Well, that depends. Uh, it depends on external circumstances, which are definitely not up to me. Uh, I can do everything right and yet being hit by you know, a car on the next time that I cross the street or uh, being affected by a terminal disease that has uh, nothing to do with, with my lifestyle or, and so on and so forth. Right? So I, can, I am responsible and in charge of my decisions, which stem from judgments, but I am not responsible for the outcomes. And so what Epictetus is saying, what he calls actually the fundamental rule of life, which tells you that he thinks this is very important, is that we should always keep in mind this distinction between what is up to us and what is not up to us. And that the right attitude is to focus our efforts 
on what is up to us because that's where our agency actually lies. It's, this, is, this is what we can do. And then develop an attitude of acceptance and equanimity toward the things that are not up to us. Right? So, you know, and this goes not just for the big things in, in life, but for the minor ones. Uh, for instance, you know, I, before we started this conversation, I told you that I was actually in Edinburgh very recently. And, uh, you know, at some point, we, with my daughter, I was visiting with my daughter, so at some point, of course, we had to uh, get back to the airport and, you know, in time for, for our flight. Now, we knew what, when the flight was. We had an estimate of how long it would take to get to the airport, and we knew that we had to go through security and all that sort of stuff. So our judgment was, all right, we're leaving three hours earlier um, so that we have plenty of time. That judgment turned out to be correct in that case because there was no incident, you know, no accident in between. There was nothing that happened that precluded us from getting to the airport with plenty of time when we got on the plane. But it could have. Uh, we could have taken a car and there might have been an accident or uh, the road might have been closed and whatever that it, we would not have gone into the, uh, to the airport in time. So in those kind of situations, you remind yourself, well, what was up to me here? was to make a reasonable decision about when to leave for the airport, which I did. So I have nothing to blame myself uh, for. But if it turns out that I can't get to the airport in time because there is an accident on the, on the road, then I just have to accept, because it's not up to me, that thing is not up to me, I have to accept that I'm going to miss the plane and not get upset about it because it's like, why would I get upset? It's like, okay, I did everything that I could, and it still didn't work out, so, you know, I need to start focusing on the next step, which is, well, when is the next flight uh, leaving, and, you know, can I book it, or, you know, what is the worst thing I can, that, that might happen? Maybe I'll have to come back to the, to the, the town and, and spend one extra night in Edinburgh. Well, that's not a worst thing that could possibly, you know, I think that, not, that, that Exactly. Thing. I think, uh, to put a positive spin on it, you've done exactly that, but I think in terms of it's a very important point, even though it's, it's such a simple one and such a real life example, is that if we devote resources emotionally to, oh, if I'd left an hour earlier, if I'd done this, if I'd done that, you are using resources that could otherwise be devoted to finding a solution and therefore yep. getting back to some sort of baseline emotion. So for me, the, the, the big thing for me that's allowed me to calibrate this over the years and, and, and sort of regular listeners will know this is that ultra endurance event events in general will present me with things that go wrong and as you're tired you're fatigued you're 40 hours deep or whatever it might be and your immediate emotional snap to something makes you feel a certain way bringing yourself back to some sort of practical right how do I take the next step forward rather than what could I have done 30 steps back is a great way to actually just keep moving forward <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's all we're really doing on a day-to-day -day basis, isn't yep. it? We're, we're enjoying the process in a different way, but we're just trying to find a way to keep moving forward. So from a going back to what we were saying before, the it's the exact same as virtue, whereby I have the wisdom and the knowledge to know, right, if there is a car crash that's preventing me from getting to the airport, then, okay, I know that there's nothing I could have done about that. And then doing the work over time is constantly wrestling with yourself internally to be able to just think practically about what needs to be done next rather than what if what could have been and all that stuff. So I think that's a really, whilst it's a, a, a such a classic example that, that we've all lived through in some capacity, I'm sure it's a right. very, very digestible example for people to take home and try and think about, right, next time you're presented with something that you actually could not have controlled if your judgment was correct within the parameters that you had available to you, find a solution rather than focus on the emotion. Um, and that's a that's a very stoic focused teaching, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, and when I present examples like that well people uh, and i and i point out for instance that uh, essentially as you were implying that uh, regret is not something that the stoics indulge in because regret is about trying to change things in the past and the past is definitely not up to you to change so it's like why why would you want to wallow in regret the only thing you're doing is is injuring yourself at an emotional level now whenever i have often when i have these conversations uh, people would say well but i can't help it you know, I just feel that, that way. I just feel that I experience that emotion. And that is simply not true. Of course you can help it. Uh, there is very good empirical evidence. It's not just the Stoics that tell us so. There is very good empirical evidence from modern science, from cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, that of course you can change your emotions. Not, not 
in a snap, you know, by snapping your fingers. That's not true. It, it does require uh, exercise. It does require mindfulness. But for instance, in the case that we're talking, just to stick with that example for a second, let's say that, in fact, an accident then happened and we had missed the, the plane, right? Yes, I understand that it might come natural for somebody to say, oh, damn it, you know, and focus on the negative part and the, on the part that he actually you cannot change anymore. What you do in that point, you take a, deep, a, a breath or two or three, if, if needed, and then you gently nudge your mind back to focus on what needs to be done as opposed to thinking back to what has happened. Yes, your mind will, especially early on when you're not trained, will go back to the regret, and then you nudge it back again toward the task at hand. And once you do that, and the important thing is that you need to do this mindfully, meaning you know, paying attention to what you're doing. Epictetus uses the word prosoke, which literally means paying attention. Right? So just refocus, re re redirect your focus to what needs to be done, and gently. Because if, you know, one thing that doesn't work is if you sort of more or less violently want to just get a thought out of your way, then that's the sure way to get your thought back immediately because your mind will go there, will go there insistently. But you can do that. This is, this is something that can definitely be done. Yes, it will require practice. It, we won't work initially very, very well, but the more you do it, the more it, the more it does work. So I've been practicing this, this thing, this sort of mindful mindfully going back to the task at hand as opposed to uh, indulging in regret. And initially it was difficult. But now, every time that something happens, that a potential setback occurs, my immediate first automatic thought is, okay, what is up to me here? And, and then I start focusing on, on that part. And it immediately makes you feel better. Because one of the things that causes anxiety uh, and, uh, and regret is precisely the fact that you feel like you're not, you don't have power over the situation. You're, you're powerless. Powerlessness is something that human beings don't really like. And so focusing on what you can do in a given situation, however little it may be, uh, is crucial because you regain control of your actions, you regain control of your emotional responses, and you actually uh, you know, face the setback in a more productive, constructive fashion. Exactly that. Something that I've, I've had to do the work on over the years as well, and I'm very thankful I have, because I now feel much more under control when things do go south. And they will, and they yeah. always will. Inevitably, <laughs> Sadly, yes. that, can't be, that can't be overridden. So final question, as it's something that's a very, very core principle within Stoke Philosophy. How in the modern day can we be better leaders, according to the Stoics? Yeah, that's a crucial question that, of course, I explore in, in, the, in the book, in, in How to Be Good. And uh, you might not be surprised that there is no simple silver bullet that you, know, you can solve the problem, because if there, if there were, somebody else would have articulated it before I, before I did. However, there are a couple of things you can do. The first thing is to pay attention to the next generation. One of the points that I make in the book is that Becoming virtuous and working on your character is very difficult after you pass your early 20s. Uh, we, the the Greco-Romans knew that. Um, they talk about the, the age of reason, which starts between 7 and 8 years old and goes on until you're about a teenager. And modern cognitive science also tells you that once you're in your 20s, your brain is pretty much set. So things will improve, especially if you work on them willfully and, you know, and mindfully, but not radically. You're not going to be able to make any major radical change to your character. So we need to look at the next generation. And a very good example of that is a documentary that is out now called Young Plato, which is set in uh, uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. And uh, it is about a, the principal of an elementary school who uses philosophy to help his kids overcome you know, their their day-to-day -day challenges and as well as to deal with the background environment in which they grew up. And even though the, the, the principal in question uses philosophers from all ages and multiple cultural backgrounds, uh, not surprisingly, he keeps going back over and over to Socrates and the Stoics because those are the ones that are more practical. They're the ones that, that actually, uh, you know, resonate even with the kids. And you can see how that works very nicely. I mean, you can see that a kid of that age, elementary school or middle, uh, middle school, 
That's where you really want to do the work. So if you want good leaders uh, in the future for the next generation, then you need to work. We need to work now on our kids. And it is something that astonishingly we don't do. Uh, you know, Young Plato is an it's a documentary because it's an it's an exception. It's one of the very few instances where somebody is actually teaching ethical philosophy to kids. We should be doing this worldwide, everywhere, and it's really stunning that we don't. So that's one thing. The other thing that we can do right now in terms of sort of um, ameliorating the current situation is to pay again attention, to go back and, back and pay attention to the character of our politicians, our elected leaders. After all, if we live in a more or less democratic country, like the United States, let's say, we are ultimately responsible for who we put up there. Uh, you know, it's, it's very fashionable to complain about politicians. Uh, you know, your prime minister just resigned this morning. As yes, yeah, two, hour, <laughs> two hours before this call, yeah. <laughs> and the Irish Times just published an interview with me in which I talk about Liz Truss uh, in that context. So it was kind of uh, timing. Did you, uh, did you make any bets on when she was going to resign? Because you could be... Uh could be feeling quite smug right now that, so right that's right <laughs> i should have right but it's very uh, easy for us to say or to complain about oh you know he or she is that that guy or that person is you know is bad and all that yeah but who put it there i mean ultimately the buck stops with us and i think that we've been doing a particularly bad job over the last years to decades perhaps putting people in charge be precisely because we ourselves have lost track of what's important. Character is, I think, more important in a politician than the specific platform. Because quite frankly, even though I consider, for instance, myself on the more or less left side of the political spectrum, I'm sort of somewhat a progressive or something like that, I much rather have a conservative in charge who, however, really wants to do the right thing and has integrity of character and wants to compromise, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then even somebody on my side of the spectrum who, however, is fickle and lies and cheats all the time because in the long run, I think that we're going to get better results if people honestly try to do a good job as opposed to just pandering uh, and, and lining their pockets. So, uh, so character is important, and it's, it's, it's up to us to clean up the house, so to speak, and, and try to, to get rid of a lot of these people that really should not be there. And it starts from within. So there's lots of things that we can all take from today yes, that we can, uh, we can utilize to improve our own character. And then in turn, we can set a better example for others, help them improve theirs. And before we know it, we've solved the political conundrum we find ourselves in. Wishful thinking, I know, but no, thank you very much. Yeah, really, really I mean, that's optimistic. That. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. But, <laughs> but we're going to make some progress. The point we'll call, is we're what what, what was the phrase before? It was um, uh, d d d d d d something Platonism rather than uh, scummy. Oh, oh, yes. We, we, are, we, are, we have to understand that we, are, we live in the scum of Romulus, not in, in Plato's Republic. And exactly that. Yes. I've, ju I've just uh, depicted Plato's Republic when in reality it will probably stay a little bit longer in the scum of Romulus. So. <laughs> exactly. But no, wishful thinking is something we can employ. Nonetheless, really, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And yeah, look forward to catching up soon. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Just quickly, actually. Where can people find you and where is the best place for them to get your books? The book is, uh, can be found anywhere you buy books, online or, or offline. As far as everything else that I do, you can find it at massimofuelucci.org. Fantastic. Thank you again and speak soon. Thank you.